Hi everybody, it's Helen from the Squiggly Careers podcast. And before today's episode starts, I want to let you know about some news that Sarah and I are really excited about. 10 years ago in October was the moment that Squiggly started. We sat down together, a squiggle was drawn on a napkin and this idea to help people with their careers came to life. Since then, things have grown a bit and we would love to celebrate that growth with you. On October the 17th, we will be holding Squiggly Careers Live in London. The show starts at 7pm. We've got four brilliant guests who are going to be talking to us about meaning, motivation and money. Come and join us. Tickets are limited. They are £30 each and there'll be a chance to connect and talk to each other after the event as well. All the details are on our website, amazingif.com forward slash squiggly. That's amazingif.com forward slash squiggly. So we hope to see you there. And now let's get on with today's episode. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Helen. And this is the Squiggly Careers Podcast, where every week we share some ideas and some actions that we hope will help you to navigate that squiggly career with a bit more confidence and control. And one of the ways we try to give you a bit more control is we take our episodes and we turn it into pod sheets. These are practical tools to help you to take action. You can get them on our website, amazingif.com, and it's linked in the show notes as well. And in addition to that, if you would like a bit more squiggly support with the topics we talk about, you can always join us at Pod Plus. We host a free 30 minute session every Thursday. Thursday morning so it's nine o'clock UK time you'll have to translate that into whatever time zone you're in but it's always free it's a brilliant community of people and you get the opportunity to sort of ask questions we bring to life some of the models that we talk about I think it just gives people a bit of a boost who happen to like learning about their career so if that (laughs) is you you might want to come along and like I said all the info for that is on amazingif.com or just email us we're helen and sarah at squigglycareers.com and so this week we're talking about how to lose ladder-like language So why are we taking on this topic? Well, Helen and I are getting increasingly interested in how the words that we use at work impact our reality. And I think so often we're not conscious of how corporate language or, you know, jargon, which we probably have talked about before, creeps into our conversations. So we're probably all familiar with some of the classics. We'll take this offline. I'll put a pin in it. The parking lot reaching out i'm never a big fan of that one helen any others that you hear well now you say it sarah i heard you say one earlier in the meeting we had before this (laughs) did you i did and i thought i was like bang you're gonna save that you're like oh i'm literally i'm talking to you in a minute on the podcast i'm like i'm just gonna scribble that one down smirk that you didn't see but do you know what sarah i think what we should do is uh keep the powder dry (gasps) oh Oh, yeah, I did say that. Yeah. I do quite like that phrase, actually. Do you think that's a corporate phrase? Keep the powder dry. Do you know what I think it is probably? You know, we've talked about warlike language ages ago yeah, yeah. with John from Leon. I think, I mean, I haven't looked into the origins of the phrase, but it sounds a bit military. Do you think? Right, the gunpowder dry. Oh. I don't know. I mean, I haven't looked at it. What do you think it means? I don't know. I can't help but think about talcum powder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's about talcum powder, but I, I think it might be about gunpowder oh. and how you have to keep it dry. I mean, I could be totally making this up. Yeah. I can't wait to look at this afterwards. But anyway, I would suggest that that was an example of corporate language that's just not needed. But I loved you saying it. <laughs> we work really hard in Amazing If to try and sort of call each other a bit in a sort of friendly and encouraging way when we do use language that we feel like might be getting in our way that isn't simple and straightforward. I think that we said creeps for a reason. I don't think we choose to go reaching out or offline. None of us want to be saying these things, but they just become the common words that we hear. So we all just start using them and then at some point you forget about it. So there's general corporate language, but what we're gonna focus on today is specifically ladder-like language around our careers. There's a great quote from a philosopher who says, the words that we use frame how we see the world. And we think if we keep framing our careers using lots of ladder-like words, maybe without even realising it, it sort of takes us back to that linear staircase. So we might be trying to adopt squiggly, but then maybe we're saying steps or career plans, or we're asking someone in an interview, where do you see yourself in five years time? And it fixes us and sort of forces us to go back to that career ladder. So I think it limits our learning and it also probably limits the quality of the conversations that we have about our careers when we're sort of stuck in using some of these words that have been used for a long time in lots of organisations. 
And it's useful to reflect on where do these words show up for you? So some example places might be in career conversations, like is that where this ladder light language might be creeping in? Interviews, like Sarah mentioned, one of those very common ladder light career questions. It might come out in your LinkedIn profile or your recommendations. You know, I stepped up into this new position, for example. You might write that about yourself. It also comes up in a lot of self-help books. You know, what's the next step on your career? And I'm always like, oh, can we not replace that? where I really see it, it drives me mad every time, is in the media Mm. when they talk about often senior people's career moves, except they don't call it a career move. So they don't go, oh, the CEO has made a fascinating career move into, I don't know, being a zookeeper or whatever it is. They don't say that. They go, CEO dot, dot, dot has stepped down Mm. into a position. And every time I see that, I'm like, oh, your words are influencing so many people and can we not I want to get in touch with that journalist but I feel like it's passive aggressive or actively aggressive I can't decide which (laughs) I can't decide send them a copy of Squiggly with like the Squiggly career gloss and try to make them kind of get them to do the swap but yeah when I see that in those places I just want to take out a highlighter or a retro bit of Tipex and rewrite it for them And a model that I find really useful whenever I'm trying to do any kind of change, behavior change or sort of language change, I always find the the conscious competence model useful. It's an oldie, it's from like the 1970s by Noel Birch, but it really helps me to see where am I at in terms of like how I'm thinking or behaving at the moment and how can I get to where I want to be. So there are four stages of the conscious competence model. So the first stage is actually where Sarah was. She didn't realize that she was saying, keep the powder dry earlier so that is where you are it's harsh language everyone but that is where you are unconsciously incompetent so you don't even realize what you're saying like you're not trying to use necessarily ladder like language you might not even like the idea of it but you kind of don't know that you're doing it corporate language ladder like language it's just sort of become part of the pattern of your conversation So that's often where lots of people start. It's why feedback can be really important because until somebody says to you, oh, Sarah, did you know you were saying that? Or Helen, maybe there might be a better way that you could do this. Until someone perhaps calls it out, it's hard for you to become conscious of it. So stage one is often I'm unconsciously incompetent. I don't even know that I'm saying this. Then once you've become aware, you become consciously incompetent so you might still say oh what's your next step or really interested in seeing your career plan or whatever it is you might still say those things but you almost stop yourself like you half I do this with like open and closed questions (laughs) I'm consciously incompetent with my questions so I know it is better to coach people by asking them an open question like what are you interested in doing but sometimes I might start closed like do you want to do this Mm -hmm. and I have to stop myself or once I've said it reframe it because I'm consciously incompetent I know that that's not the best way to have that conversation then we move on to the third level of the model which is where you become consciously competent so you know what the language is like what squiggly career language sounds like or what it looks like and you try very very hard to put that language into place like in your emails in your on your cv maybe in your career conversations you might even have a bit of a squiggly career script where you've kind of got that language that you can really focus on saying it but you are trying quite hard it is quite an intentional act to use that you're very aware of it but then what happens over time is you get to the last part of the model and this is where the change it really sticks this is where you become un consciously competent so you have completely moved away from ladder like language and you've completely swapped to squiggly and you don't even think about it anymore you know you just happen to talk about possibilities instead of plans you happen to talk about career curiosity instead of you know fixing your future or whatever it's it's just natural to the way that you talk about your career and I find it a very useful way of thinking like where am I now Perhaps I'm unconsciously incompetent and I need to get a bit of feedback. Or perhaps I wear these words, but I'm still sort of flipped between the two and I need to have maybe a squiggly script or a bit of a career glossary that might help me with my career conversation. So maybe have a think about what that might look like for you. Consciously, unconsciously, like mm-hmm. a few like words there. It might be easier if you look at the pod sheet for this episode, we will put that model on there so you can maybe sort of look at it and reflect on where you might be. So what we thought might be useful is to talk through some squiggly swaps. So what are some of the ladder-like words that we hear all the time? And I'm sure we're guilty of saying some of the time too. And what might we say instead, both to ourselves, which we've framed as a coach yourself question, 
but also what might we say to someone else? So a coaching question in case you're having career conversations or mentoring chats. So the first one is moving from plans, so career plans that fix us to a future, to possibilities, which feels much more open-ended, adaptable, flexible, and curious. So this would sound like if you're asking yourself a coach self question, what three possibilities am I intrigued by? Rather than saying, what is my career plan? And a coaching question might sound like, who could I connect you with for a curious career conversation? So actually helping somebody to go and explore their possibilities. And I think this is an interesting one because I am somebody who loves a plan. I respond really well to planning. I'm naturally organized. (laughs) I'm very future focused. And I am somebody who has developed in my time lots of career plans because I think it was an attempt by me, however clumsy it might have been, to take ownership and control. So it did come from a sort of positive place around career and career development but I was very sort of binary about oh well, these are the exact job titles I want to do and then in this very specific time frame this thing is going to happen and it felt like a tick list I think or a bit of a checklist of like here is my plan and more like a blueprint like this is a blueprint for what's going to happen in my career at what time in what way and it assumes a perfect world and also it does assume that you can sort of control everything that you're going to be successful in every role that you apply for that what you enjoy right now is what you're always going to enjoy and again like it just takes you back doesn't it to that idea of like you're going up this staircase or you're climbing this ladder and so I think they just don't feel flexible enough having this kind of idea of a plan just doesn't have that flexibility but we also know we don't want to leave our careers to chance we want to have this kind of create don't wait mindset and so just hoping for the best certainly if you're someone like me and you love a plan you're like well that doesn't feel acceptable either and that's where I think possibilities works well so I've used this in career conversations in organizations where maybe a leader is saying to me you know where do you see yourself or maybe asking me quite a plan like question And rather than saying a job title or role, I would often respond with, well, there are a few possibilities that I am interested in. You know, I think my strengths would lend themselves well to this sort of role, or I've really enjoyed doing dot, dot, dot. And any move or role that would help me to do more of that would always be really interesting for me. And what I found by talking possibilities versus plans I think also it takes pressure away from conversations because I think sometimes managers and directors think you go to those conversations and they're expected to make some of these things happen. You know, that whole you're um, making your development dependent on somebody else. But I think as soon as I started talking possibilities, everybody relaxes a bit because it's just much more open. We're having much more of a two-way conversation and it just feels like you're just exploring, which is always a good place to be. So the next squiggly swap that we would suggest is moving from steps, so the idea that you step up or step down, like I mentioned that you often see in the newspapers, to moves or roles. So if I kind of frame that in a statement, so it feels maybe more familiar, the ladder-like one might sound like Sarah's next step in the organisation is dot, dot, dot. And a more squiggly swap where talking about that would be some of the roles that Sarah is currently exploring are or some of the moves that Sarah has talked about that she would like to make include and so the step up step down it implies that you know the only way is up basically which often limits a conversation very quickly and gets you kind of stuck on a ladder because if that more senior position isn't possible then it becomes really restrictive people's career even though sometimes I've spoken to lots of people that have made moves to back to things they've done before and they've found that really really enjoyable when we frame it as stepping down or stepping back it feels a bit like failure and so people just completely discount it when we're talking about what moves would you like to make or what roles would you be interested in you know progressing into or exploring then we take away the judgment about almost like the direction of that development Mm. like it's not saying up is good and back is bad it's saying actually in a squiggly career you can develop in different directions and what we're just trying to work out is what what's right for you right now. And any time we can take judgment away from the career moves that people are making, we will open up that conversation. When we restrict it to, you know, one way is good and the other is bad, often people aren't honest about what they want from work and they sort of tell us what they think we want to hear. And that's like never for a good basis for a career conversation. So a coach yourself question is what role would I do if I knew I couldn't fail, 
again, that kind of takes that sort of fear and judgment away. And the coaching question that you can ask someone else is what roles would you like to try out for a week if you have the chance? So again, we're not trying to say you have to do this forever and this is going to determine the direction of your development for the entirety of your career. We're just trying to unlock that openness and that squiggly language and those coaching questions are a really good way of doing that. So our next squiggly swap is moving from titles to talents. Job titles now, I mean, no one can understand anyone's job title anymore. I think the (laughs) variety and meaning of job titles has disappeared out the window, to be honest. And even if they are relatively accurate, they do only share a very small slice of who you are and what you do. I'm never sure about it, but you know, some people don't even put their titles on LinkedIn anymore. And I can really understand why people do that. I think I can't quite work out an alternative that I feel comfortable with, but I have seen people just describe themselves as like creator, learner, entrepreneur. You know, they sort of use more descriptive words rather than going, my job title is head of marketing or whatever it might be. So I think we can get fixed on titles. I think often not because people, I mean, maybe sometimes people want the title, but it's because it's a default to go, it implies a certain level and a certain layer within an organization. And then I think people's status and identity gets quite wrapped up in these titles. And I think I've been guilty of this before. When you're in, you know, really big organizations that do feel very layered and quite hierarchical, you just sort of feel like your worth increases depending on however big that title is. And so letting go of some of these areas, I think like doing some of these squiggly swaps, I think we shouldn't underestimate like how hard that can be if you've attached your identity to one of these. I let go of titles quite a long time ago now, but I don't think that was an easy process for me because I think I'd sort of conditioned myself to be like, well, that's what's important. I am more important. I am better at my job. I am worth more the bigger that kind of job title is. Whereas I think talents paint much more of a picture of who we are. We are all talented. We've all got different talents. It's our skills. It's our strengths. It's the talents that we want to make stronger. It's the things that we build our reputation for and want to be recommended for. And I think it just shows more of what we've got to give and that we've all got loads of things you know your talents is probably a really long list but there are probably three or four that you really want to stand out and to show up throughout your career sometimes described as you know like the red thread or the things that you might have in common and when I think about my talents doing very different kinds of jobs in very different kinds of organizations there are at least a couple I'm like they're really consistent I think it's often a, a much more useful way to think about like who you are and what you've got to give. So a coach yourself question, we've actually cheated here and got two around talents. The first one is what do I enjoy the most about my week? And the second one is what gives me the most energy? Now, the reason we kept both of those in is we reflected when we were sort of testing these questions out on ourselves is that sometimes enjoyment is different to energy. So Helen, if you were answering that question, maybe thinking about like your week this week, what are you enjoying the most, but also what's giving you the most energy? Like how different are they? Yeah, they're really different. So the things that I enjoy the most about my week, no, that gives me energy. These are different Uh... things. My enjoyment one is often like getting stuff done. You know, like at the end of it, I'll be like, oh, I love that. I got that done. I got that project done. I got that thing set up. I've come up with that idea and I've got it progressed. It's often about moving things on, getting stuff done. The thing that gives me the most energy, the thing that like excites me more, like the fuels me would be, and we don't get to do this every week, to be honest, but when you and I would, when we get a chunky amount of time together and we'll be thinking about something brand new and almost like a bit of creative tension between us. I love that when we're like, oh, what about this? And then we listen to each other and we get to a better outcome and that gives me so much energy because I, I think that takes us further forward into the future. Like I enjoy getting stuff done, but taking our business further into the future gives me energy. They're quite different things. So I think when you're thinking about your talents, they are probably two of my talents. Like getting stuff done is one of my talents. Creating stuff for the future, you know, and exploring and prototyping is another one of my talents. And so by asking those questions, I'm able to identify some slightly different things. And I think that's why it's useful to ask yourself both. Yeah, I think you get more awareness that you can figure out, well, what does that mean for you? What's the so what? When I was reflecting on it, I also get to really different answers because I was thinking one of the things that I enjoy the most about a week is always when I have time alone, time by myself. <laughs> uh, Leave me alone. 
alone, Helen. Yeah, time by myself to, you know, work on something or develop something or write something. So I always, you know, if I think about, you know, moments of enjoyment, it's always like deep focus work by myself. I enjoy that. And it may or may not have a obvious outcome. Sometimes it might be a, well, here's a proposal, but sometimes it might just be, I've put some ideas on a bit of paper. But what gives me most energy is always with other people. So I actually get loads of energy from when I've got a group of people together from an organisation, maybe we're doing a career development programme. I'm doing one this week with one organisation where we're running their careers week and they're 45 minute sessions every day and they give me so much energy and there's loads of people. I suppose the thing that gives me energy there is I'm taking energy from those people because they're all contributing loads, they're really enthusiastic. So I am enjoying it as well, but it's a different feeling. I think sometimes enjoyment and energy, maybe they'll be the same for some people, but I just think good to see see if you can spot any distinctions. And then a coaching question here would be, what strengths do you want to be recommended for? Our fourth squiggly swap is moving from the language of destinations. So maybe that's like naming a role that you're definitely going to do in the future to a direction, a sense of where your squiggly career might be taking you. And I have to sort of like, I'm red flagging myself here, but also as I'm saying the word red flag, I'm like, oh gosh, is red flag is that corporate one? language? We could get ourselves is that corporate language? Is that one of those things that I'm, I'm now like consciously incompetent? <laughs> ah, we just basically just, just stop speaking. speaking. If we don't speak, we can't I get know, it wrong. Just stop speaking. The Squiggly Chris podcast has gone silent <laughs> for the last 10 minutes. As, as we speak, try to work out whether keep your powder dry and red flags are actually military terms, which I think on the powder dry one, you were actually right. Do you think red flag is? I don't know. Oh my know. gosh, where's red flag come from? Oh no. Okay, just bear with us, everybody, because the, we're learning the thing too. that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're learning too. But I'm going to red flag myself because I was having a career conversation with somebody today, actually. And I think I had unintentionally fix someone to a destination. Mm. And then the reason this is important is even, you know, Sarah and I talk about this stuff all the time and it we still make mistakes with this stuff. We're still trying to make sure that we get it right too. But I had talked to somebody about a role that they might be interested in the future and how we enabled the work that they were doing to take them towards that particular position. You know, again, like most of us who influence other people's career development, it was done with the best intent. Like I want to help that person to grow, but actually fixing that person to a destination that might have come up in a conversation became a little bit restrictive. And they said to me, oh, actually, Helen, I'd like to think a bit more broadly about where I could be at that point in time. I don't need to attach myself to that role. And I was like, oh, I've fallen into, I'd fallen into like a ladder-like trap with the intention of helping someone. But actually over time, that doesn't become that helpful because all of your conversations sort of orientate towards that destination and it narrows the conversation down. So keeping people towards a direction is quite useful. And just in case it's helpful, the way that I ended up sort of pivoting that conversation for that person was I just stopped talking about a job title because obviously, as we said, title's not helpful and a particular destination. And I started talking about the mix of their responsibilities. I found that a much more helpful way. Like by that point in time, if there was a ratio of the different work that you were doing, what would you want that ratio to look like in terms of responsibility? How would you want that to change over time? And then actually the role that someone's in becomes irrelevant, to be honest. It's more about what the responsibilities you want to do and and how do we shape a role or position or spot projects that could help you to do that. So practically, that's how I evolved that conversation when I was sort of consciously incompetent. A couple of questions that might help you in this particular area. So the coach yourself question, how do I know that I'm heading in the right direction? So kind of useful to think about what are the signals that would mean that you're squiggling in a way that's working for you. And a coaching question that you could ask somebody else is whose career impact are you inspired by? So it's not what job would you like to do or whose role do you admire? It's whose impact are you inspired by? It just takes people a little bit broader when they're reflecting on this particular area. I like this question because I was thinking about it for myself, selfishly. I also think pride is quite useful when you're thinking about direction because I think doing what we do now is so different from when we were both in very big organisations where I think you perhaps have more natural signals. You're surrounded by more signals about whether you're heading in the right direction for you. Whereas I think suddenly when you're doing your own thing, it's so much up to you to sort of set your own direction. There's nothing surrounding you, no structure surrounding you. I often think about, well, what will make me proud? 
and that's how I know I'm heading in the right direction if I'm doing work and having an impact that I feel proud of what pride means is different for different people it might be you know the ways that you help other people it might be the type of work that you do it might be how often you're doing things that really stretch you or scare you I don't know exploring and discovering you've got potential that you didn't know you had all those things would make you feel proud so sometimes pride can also be a a helpful area here I think I quite like, but I thought oh, I was a bit daunting, perhaps. I quite like, what do you want your legacy to look like? <laughs> yeah, I think is, if you'd asked me that daunting. 10... Yeah, it's quite daunting, isn't it? If you'd asked me that 20 years ago, I'd be like, oh, I don't know. But now, and maybe it's because of what we do, now I kind of think I could just think about that for a little bit. But that's probably for a particular person, a particular point in time in their career. But, you know, all these questions will get you towards thinking about directions and not fixing yourself to a single destination, which is exactly what we're hoping for in Squiggly Careers. And last, but very much not least, because I think this is often the toughest one. So when we ask this question to people all around the world, I would say this usually ends up being the winner for the one that people find Mm -hmm. the hardest to let go of and do a bit of unlearning and relearning. And that's moving away from progression equals promotion. So promotion being the only way to progress to progression generally. So being able to grow and being able to develop in lots of different directions, promotion being just one way that we can progress. So it's a tough one often for people to get their heads around because initially they're like, well, if it's not promotion, what is it? I always find interesting though, is when I then do ask people for this, I'm like, okay, so what are all other than promotion? Let's now sort of create together all of the other ways that we can progress in our career. Let's see just how many we can come up with. And I sort of set the task as a sort of quantity over quality one. I'm like, I want as many as we can come up with. People are better than they give themselves credit for. I usually get 16, 20 different ways that you can progress. And the more people go, the more ideas they come up with. And so I think often people do understand when they zoom out and think big, they see that progression has got, there are so many different ways that we can all progress. The problem then becomes we go into a career conversation and we default back to, well, progression equals promotion. So it's just sort of trying to remind ourselves and remember and kind of keep with us that there are loads of ways that we can progress. So a coach yourself question here is what does progression mean to me? Most of us haven't asked ourselves that question. And when we do, I often give people time to think about that question and create a little mind map answering that question. Loads of people have said to us in the past, they have a real sort of just a small aha moment where they'll say, oh, I realise that someone else is telling me what my progression should look like. Or I assumed that progression had to mean promotion. But actually what I've realised is I'm motivated by a different kind of progression. Now, we are absolutely not anti-promotion. I think it's just that we want people to see your careers kind of more broadly and go beyond promotion. And a coaching question, if you're in a career conversation or if you're mentoring somebody, is what's the progression that you'd feel proud of in a year's time. Sometimes quite nice to, I think, do a bit of framing around time here, because if we just go, how do you want to progress? You're like, you can't help but think, don't know really, that sounds quite hard. (laughs) It's quite a hard, it's quite a big question. Whereas if you said to me, well, yeah, over the next year, how do you want to progress? That's probably how I would phrase it in my sort of everyday words. You then sort of go, okay, well, maybe there's something you'd like to learn. That'd be a bit of progression. Maybe there's something you'd like to try out for the first time. That would be a bit of progression. Maybe some progression might come from how are you working? Maybe you want to work in a different way, maybe different types of projects, different kinds of people. And you just get into a much fuller and richer conversation then, I think, about growing. And we are all kind of hardwired to want to feel like we are growing. It's not a nice feeling when we feel like we're stuck or stalling in our squiggly careers. I hear that from people, you know, you you feel that sense of like, Oh, I just, I don't feel like I am making progress. But I think when we start to sort of, when we release ourselves from progression equals promotion, it can feel actually really liberating. And then it helps us to sort of untangle that knottiness around the stuckness that sometimes we all feel in our squiggly careers. I think Sarah raised a really useful point there. So when she was saying that coaching question, you know, what's the progression you would feel proud of in a year's time? And then she sort of replayed it back in her own language a bit and said, oh, oh, actually, I'd say over the next 12 months, what progression would you feel proud of? 
that's actually a really, really useful act to do. Like to say these questions out loud, particularly if you are going to use these questions with somebody else, like as a mentor or a manager or kind of in whatever environment you're asking them, you really want these questions to sound like you. And so I would take each of these coaching questions and just say it out loud. Like just imagine you were saying it to someone else and find your own language, which might be ours. You know, you might just take these questions and ask them as they are. But I think the more this sounds like you, so the more this is your sort of tone, the words that you would use, the more natural it will feel in that conversation. And we really want that like authenticity to come through. We don't want you to feel like you're trying to say it in the way that we would. I think it's as long as you do the squiggly swaps, get rid of those ladder-like words and you replace them with the squiggly swaps, then how you kind of create that sentence or that question is, you know, that's totally up to you. We've tried to make it as easy as possible. But what's most important is make the swap and make it sound like you and then learn to listen, (laughs) which is a whole other skill in itself, which we've got podcasts on. But I think once we ask the question, we then have to learn to listen and give that person the space to respond um, with whatever is on their mind at the moment. And one idea that we've got that we would love some feedback from you on is to create a few more what we're describing as squiggly scripts. So exactly as Helen talked about there, this wouldn't be a saying, this is exactly what you should say in a career conversation, or this is exactly the words that you use. But it would give you lots of examples of this is what, say, first conversation with a mentor might sound like, whether you're the mentor or the mentee, or if you were having a conversation about a pay rise this is how you might structure it and these are the words that you might use and again give you the chance to then go well how would you say that in a way that feels like you and sounds like you so at the moment it's the germ of an idea I'm allowed to say germ of an idea is that still okay I think the start of an idea okay it might be (laughs) I literally feel like I'm like like, I've got to do a workshop after this I feel like I'm just not going to say anything I'll just be like no I can't say anything I can be on and just put a red flag up every now and again as an emoji if that wouldn't distract you (laughs) are you going to buy me some talcum powder for Christmas (laughs) <laughs> oh, I actually have some talcum powder because we use it with my son for when he's been on the beach. He helps get rid of sand. Anyway, I feel like it's a very 70s purchase. But do let us we know. Segwayed. Let us know whether those scripts feel or sound like they'd be useful for you. And what would you want scripts on? Because if we get feedback that you sort of go, well, we don't need them, thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Great. That's really helpful for us to know. If you're thinking, yeah, that'd be, I can imagine using that. I can imagine sharing that in my organisation. Get in touch with us. We're just Helen and Sarah at squigglycareers.com. And then like everything, we will probably experiment with some over the next few months. But it's always nice to know maybe where we should start and just get a bit of sort of live learning from you. People who listen, who are probably the most likely people to be our early adopters. So thank you so much for listening today. We'll summarise it, as we said, in the pod sheet. We're also going to create a one-page post that we'll put on social media. So if you do follow us at Amazing If on LinkedIn or Instagram and you see that post full of squiggly swaps, please do share it because it, that's another way that we kind of help change the language that's happening around career development is when more people can see these swaps and maybe give them a go. But that is all for this week and we'll be back with you next week. Bye for now, everyone. Bye, everyone.